and I am attempting to make it work here. So you can see both the presentation and uh, later for this, I'm going to do a short, small demo on some things here. So, okay. So I will talk about uh, how to connect to Kepnekaise, a little bit about the file system and the editors there. And uh, I'll talk about the module environment and how to load R and any how to find the available packages that is in R, how to install your own R packages and how to access R Studio. I will not talk about how to use it because uh, Pedro will cover that uh, afterwards. And then I will also look into how to run R through the batch system and a few examples. So to connect to Kepnekaise, uh, we recommend you use ThinLink. And this is particularly if you don't already have a client installed, because uh, especially since you will be using RStudio, then you will need a GUI. And that means that you will either use uh, ThinLink, which already has a GUI, or you will use... Um, What's it called? You will have some X11 server also running together with a regular SSH client. And that can also work. But otherwise, if you use ThinLink, this is all already included and it is much easier. And the client, if you don't already have it, then you can download it from the link there. And there is also a page on his PC to end system. There is more information here. Uh, it's also possible to run ThinLink through a browser. And uh, this is also explained here. I believe that there are some advantages to just installing the client and running it there. But uh, otherwise, if you just need to connect from some other computer, then it's possible to do it through the browser. And again, look at this information. So if you're installing the client, uh, it should be very easy to install regardless of operating system and it works for the majority of operating systems like Mac OS, Windows or Linux. You can so install the client, start it up, then enter the server name kepnekaise-tl.hpc2n.umu.se. After that, put your username under username. And then this is important, especially if you're using a laptop, uh, you must set these two options. But in general, uh, make sure option security is set to password. And for the laptop, make sure options screen option is unchecked for full screen mode because otherwise it can flow outside of uh, the screen size. And that means you cannot see the whole window. So. Then you enter your hpc 2 n password uh, and you should do it here. If you click connect before doing it, it will ask for it, but it will fail. So you need to put it in the password on uh, this uh, connection window. And I can just quickly show you how uh, it will look when you are connecting to ThinLink. So see, I have ThinLink installed and it says ThinLink client. So I will start it. And then you get a window that looks like this. And here I put the server name, I put my username and here I would put my password. And then if you go to options, here you can see here is security, check for password. And then on the our ah, screen has been moved to advanced, I believe. Let's see. No, display, it's called now. Okay. I updated my version and didn't check that it was renamed. It's called display now instead of screen. And uh, it should be set to windowed now. So I need to update this. Okay. Uh, and when you have done that, click connect. It will take a few moments, especially the first time while it sets up everything. And then it will connect and uh, you will be able to work on a desktop environment that is directly on a Kepnekaise login node. So if you're using other SSH clients, 
uh, if you already have something installed that you like to use, then you are using a different login node. So it's Kepnekaise without the minus TL. And uh, if you're using a GUI, again, you need an X11 server. But if you have that, you can use SSH minus capital Y and then your username at the kepnekaise.hpc2n.umu.se. And for Mac OS, you probably need to install XQuartz or for newer Mac OSs, I believe that might already be installed, but uh, you will know that. For Windows, you would need to install a client and an X11 server. Again, we recommend ThinLink, but uh, this is also an option. And this is mainly here to tell you that you are using two different login nodes. Regular SSH client is Kepnekaise without minus TL. ThinLink is Kepnekaise minus TL. So two different login nodes. Uh, so, on uh, Kepnekaise, the editors there may or may not be ones that you are, you know already because uh, the OS on Kepnekaise is Linux Ubuntu. And uh, if you're used to Windows, for instance, then you might use Notepad or something similar and that is not there, but there are several other editors such as VI or Vim, uh, Nano, Emacs, there are also others, but uh, the two easiest ones to work with is probably, well, the easiest to work with is probably Nano if you don't know any of them. So uh, just do Nano and the name of the file that you either already have or that you want to create. And then you can edit it directly in it. And then when you want to exit it, you do control, my, you press control and X at the same time, the easy way is to press down control, hold X and then push X down. And then it will uh, ask you, do you want to save it? And then afterwards it will exit. So Kipnikaisa's file system. And there is more info on this link. There are three types of uh, file systems. And for us, in this case, we mainly care about home because we don't have project storage. But if you're already in a project, you may have project storage. It will be uh, larger than what you have in home. And that is where you would usually run stuff and install programs and other things. But, and then there's Scratch, which uh, is node specific. So there is one on the login node, there's one on each of the compute nodes. And then there is home, dollar home. That is uh, your home directory. That is where you end up when you log into the computer. And uh, in this case for the course, we actually are going to probably run your batch jobs there. And normally you wouldn't, not because you can't, but, but because uh, of the size, there's only 25 gigabytes but it's enough for, the, for what we are doing in the course. That is backed up as opposed to the other ones. And it's accessible by the batch system as are the others. <coughs> Sorry. And uh, the performance is high and default readability is uh, owner. And you can change permissions with change mode and ACLs and things like this. Then the module environment. So most programs on Kepnekaise, to access them, you will first load a module. And modules are used to set up your environment for the paths to executables, libraries, etc. for some particular set of software packages. For instance, you could be loading Gromax or you could be loading a compiler. And this helps users manage your shell environment. And you can also have different uh, programs where you set different environment variable for it and they can be made and removed dynamically. So it's a very easy way of setting all paths and everything else. And it's very useful for giving you access to multiple versions. 
of programs or packages. And this is uh, particularly the case for compilers where it can be different to difficult to have different uh, versions otherwise. Modules are installed in a hierarchical layout. So some modules will only be available after you have loaded some specific compiler and or MPI version. And uh, compiler tool chains are a specific type of modules. That is software bundles for complete environments of compilers and uh, for MPI libraries, SPLAS, LAPAC libraries, etc. And I'm now going to log in to Chemnikaiser. And in this case, I'm just using a terminal window because it's going to be easier for me to show you things uh, this way because I can't fit uh, the thin link window on the screen as well. Uh, I am running a uh, Linux Ubuntu on my desktop. So, uh, so this is how you would log in using that. So you can see now I logged in to the Kepnikaiser and I am going to check it uh, ML spider. And if I say ML spider R, it's going to tell me what kind of R modules are available on Kepnikaiser. And you can see there are four of them available and we are going to use that one, version 4.0.4. And the reason for that is that uh, this is the one that our studio is compatible with, the one we have installed, and it's also the one that has uh, all the packages that we need, except for one of them, which we will install ourselves. So let's see how do I actually load this module. So I will say ML spider and then the module slash version and then it tells me as i said here you would lead uh, to load those and that is if, this is if you need to use uh, gpus and since we're not going to do this uh, for this course we're just going to choose this option when you are looking at how to load modules there will often be uh, several lines here and as they say it should be and all the modules on one of the lines so either this or this and then always also the module itself so i am going to do this i will say ml for module load and then i'll take this and copy it and then I will also copy this. That takes a little while and now it's loaded and I can use ML to see uh, what I have loaded. And as you can see here, it loaded a lot of things. There's a, a GCC compiler uh, suite here and uh, there are also various other libraries. And one thing we can see here is it loads the SciPy bundle and it loads Python also, it loads many things. And uh, one thing we want to know is uh, which packages do we have? Let's see. Because as you can see here, the R packages we need for this course are these ones. And the ones I have marked with bold are the ones that are available as extensions to the R module. And that means that what we did now when we loaded R, we also got access to these, all the ones in bold. And the only one we don't have access to is this one, which is the problematic one. And actually when you do the ML spider and uh, this then it will give you a list of extensions and I could probably just show it quickly. 
So if you sc scaled, um, scroll down, then this module provides the following extensions. And as you can see, there is a very large list and you can look through it and you can see that some of them are there. Okay. So now you would like to see what packages are available in your R version. So I am going to start R and you do that with capital R. And then we are in R and I am just going to use this one because that should work fine here. And then you can see a lot of things scroll by and that shows you the packages. And again, you can look and see which ones are there. And for instance, you well to see if for instance, our MPI is there. And it's here. Let's see. So this way you can see which packages are there. <clears throat> and in some cases, this would give you uh, more thorough results. I believe it depends on the R version, at least when I tested it, it did. So what if you want some packages that are not already installed with R? For instance, for us, we want the, the cluster nor the GNOR directory. Well, uh, first you would create a folder to install your own uh, libraries. Uh, it will actually often usually ask for where you want to install them if you haven't set this up, but it's easier to do it uh, first. So create a directory where you want to put your stuff and there should be one for each uh, version of R that you are using. So it doesn't uh, install them on top of each other. And then also set this variable here to the uh, directory you just created. And that should end up being put into the .r environment. I will just uh, exit this. And I am to do. So inside this file, I got this thing here that I put here. And I have um, done it this way so that uh, if I had created several directories that were called uh, my path to my directory and then our packages, my n minus, and then the version, then it uh, knows to find each of these uh, versions. So you can do it that way, or you can just, in this case, just uh, do this one thing. Here. So now when you have that, you should uh, install your own R packages. And most of them, you can install from inside of R. Uh, you would probably have found that when you did it on your own machine. So you find the name of the package and uh, you can usually find them on R cran. Uh, or you can just uh, take the ones from the list and then you will type install pack dot packages and then uh, these uh, quotation marks around the name of the package and then press enter or return and then you will uh, get the package installed. And this happens inside of R. You can also do it outside of R like this. And that will work as long as uh, there are no dependencies for it because otherwise you will, it will complain and it will tell you to install those first. And you also need access to, on, to R, of course. You need that installed already on your own machine, or if it's on Kepnikai, say you need to load the R module. And what then, uh, if uh, it's something you want to manually download and install, again, you can do that. You can download it from uh, RCRAN, or you can download it from GitHub, or wherever it is that your R package is uh, available. Uh, make sure R is available, install it or load it. 
and then install with this command that is r command install r cmd install minus l and then the path to uh, your package that should be have or oh, something missing here uh, no this is uh, where you want to install it and this is the name of the thing so you also need that yes and no matter how you installed it, you now will be able to use it the same as you did with any other R package. That is, inside of R, you load it with library and then uh, the package. So. And here I was attempting to write cluster nor and mixed up something. Anyway, uh, cluster nor needs to be installed. Uh, on Kepnikaise and on your own machine, you also needed to install the other ones. But uh, let's look at cluster nor since it's a very special case. And uh, I think I will go directly to that because it's uh, here. I just want to say uh, there is a page about how to install stuff on uh, our website and also specifically for Linux Ubuntu because some of them are, can be installed as uh, Debian packages. So the R package cluster nor on Kepnikaise and possibly also on your own machine, but uh, note that it needs to be R version four or larger that you have installed. Otherwise it will not install because there are some dependency issues. For instance, I cannot install it here on my own desktop because I am running an R version that is uh, three point something, and that is too low for it to install. But uh, if you have version four or larger, as we do on Kepnikai, so then you can install it. So again, set up the directory as uh, we talked about. If you already did, you shouldn't do it again. You should uh, say export this rlibs user. You can also just put it directly to the R environment. And then when you have done that, cluster nor to install that, since it's not on CRAN, R CRAN, you need to install from the GitHub. So what you do is that you clone this. It is explained on their GitHub page, but you just do git clone minus minus recursive and then the path to uh, their GitHub uh, repo. Then when it has cloned it, you go into it and then you install. And it should install without issues. It did uh, for me, I just tested it earlier. And again, you need to have the R module uh, loaded first. But if you do that, then this should work just fine on Kepnikaise. And then I will just briefly say how to install R Studio. And again, that is explained in these uh, links that uh, are about how to set up things. Uh, on Kepnikaise, it's already installed. It's installed on the ThinLink login node. So from there, you can access this directly. And uh, let's see if this can actually be seen. It may not be. I'll just briefly make this larger. So this is how the screen looks when you have logged in to the Kepnikaise ThinLink node. And um, if you go under applications and down to programming, then you will see that R Studio is here. And you start it by simply clicking that. So that is uh, quite uh, friendly. <laughs> So what if you want to run a longer or parallel R program? Uh, then it's the same case as it is for all other longer or parallel programs on the batch, then you need to use the batch system. And that is because if you're running it on the login node, it will uh, slow down the login node for everyone. So uh, you need to run that through the batch system. And the batch system is called Slurm. It's an open source job scheduler. It has three key functions. It keeps track of available system resources. 
It enforces local system resource usage. It has job scheduling policies, as uh, Pedro also mentioned this. Manages a job queue, distributed work across resources according to these policies and so on. It's not so important now, it's just important to know that there is something that makes sure that your jobs will run. And in order to run such a batch job, you need to make a slurm submit file. And this can be named several things, but uh, in this case, I'll just call it a submit file. And when you are submitting jobs to it, you must use the course project in this case, or otherwise another project. So you simply need a project to be able to submit jobs to the batch system. There's a lot more guides and documentation on our websites here. So a few very short uh, commands to the batch system. I'm going to turn off my plant light because it's very pink. Um, so to submit the job, you use sbatch and then the name of your job script. And if you have a successful submission, then you will get a job ID number. And these uh, uh, outputs and errors from when you ran the job, they will per default go into slurm minus the job ID dot out. It's possible to split it up, so you get it in different files, errors and the outputs, and it's also possible to, of course, send it to some other file. And uh, the program you are running may make its own output files, but this is the default. To see a list of all jobs, you will do SQ, and usually you only want to see your own jobs. So you will say SQ minus U and your username. I'll just show you here what happens if you do SQ. You will see that there is a lot of jobs here because many people are running stuff. So you really do probably just want to see your own jobs with this. If you add the flag minus minus start, you will get an estimated job start name, start time. This can change depending on other people's jobs because they may have a longer, they may submit some long job and they may have better priority or one of their jobs may uh, end faster than uh, expected. And in that case, the start time will change, but uh, it will give an estimate. To check on a specific job, you will do S control show job and the job ID. And to delete a specific job, you will do S cancel the job ID, or you can delete all your jobs with S cancel minus you, your username. So let us look at a patch um, script, submit script for a serial R job. And uh, first, there is this sort of an incantation. It needs to be there always to tell the batch system that it runs in the batch shell, which it needs to because that is the only of the shells that is completely compatible with the batch system. Then you put the job ID, or sorry, the project ID. And for this course, it is this one. And then uh, you can name your job. This is useful because uh, if you have many jobs, then uh, you can see which one it was in this list. This is uh, the job name, which uh, you can see if it's not named anything, it will just get some default name that is probably the name of your submit script. Then you tell it how long you want to run it. And in this case, I'm going for 10 minutes. Job time is hours, minutes, seconds. The maximum is one week or 168 hours. You can name the output file and the error file. As I said, I'm just giving an example here. So these two are not necessary. It's just if you want to name the output and error file something separately. I am adding this. This is a good thing to put into the name because that will put the job ID there. That means if you rerun your job, it will not overwrite the previous outputs. And then I'm saying how many uh, tasks I want. Uh, and in this case, I want one, it's a serial job. Uh, the default is one CPU per task. You can change it with minus minus CPUs per task. 
or minus C for short. So then you load any modules you need. First, I purge any other modules that I may have. That means that if you, for instance, have something in your login script that loads modules, which you shouldn't, but if you do, then they will be removed. And then you are loading the modules that you need. This way you avoid any interference from other modules. And then you just uh, run your example with R. And in this case, I am also putting it to showing another example here where it goes all to our example dot out. So putting several examples into this one. Uh, so what if uh, I want to do a parallel R job using our MPI? Then it is much the same. It's just that you need more tasks. You possibly need more time if it's longer and then uh, you run it with MPI run. And uh, note, you need to load the RMPI library inside your R script. And another note, you cannot spawn slaves with MPI spawn R slaves. It will not work with the versions we have on Kepnikaiser at the very least. And uh, I don't remember if the issue is with the R versions there or if the issue is with the slum uh, uh, batch uh, scheduler, but there is a problem that means it will uh, mess up uh, something in MPI. So uh, you cannot do that. So what if you instead want to use do parallel? Then uh, you first, let's assume we have some small program that we call do parallel.r, and then you load do parallel library. And then uh, for instance, you could uh, make a cluster with four, and then you do register do parallel for this cluster. And then whatever the code is that you want executed in parallel, and then afterwards you stop the cluster. So this is a very small example. And I am sure we will have more and longer examples later in the course. So let's assume that we want to run this again. Uh, let's ask for some uh, resources to run on. And in this case, I am saying I want uh, one node, one whole node on the Kepnik ISIS that's 28 course, as uh, Pedro mentioned. And then I'm saying how many tasks, uh, well, many CPUs per task. And then I load the modules. And then again, I run this. And in this case, I'm not using MPI run. I'm using instead just R to run it. And then uh, you need to put this here. And then the name of your R program. And then one more thing, just mention again, there is a project for the workshop. You need to put it in batch jobs and you do that like this. And uh, this project is good until the 1st of January. That means that you have until then to run uh, these examples and exercises if there's something you haven't uh, finished running or testing before. So um, you can play with it for some weeks. And uh, after that, uh, the project will stop uh, existing or whatever. So, but until then you can test it. So this is uh, the login node for the thin link. And this is the login node for the regular Kepner Kaiser. And I will say just one more thing. And then let's see here. So you can see here, this is uh, the GitHub page. And in order to get these uh, stuff here, the presentation, the scripts, everything, then go to this green code button here, click it. And in this case, you pick HTTPS because you don't have uh, write access or whatever to this uh, GitHub repo. So you do the HTTPS, you copy this, yeah, copy it. And then you can go to uh, your own computer 
and then you say git clone and then this uh, link here to the repo and then i'm cloning into a directory that's called parallel r course and then i can cd into it and you can see what's here and you can see that it's the same things that you saw here so you now have a copy of it and in this directory script there are some uh, program examples and things in the intro directory there is uh, these uh, batch jobs also that i just mentioned so for instance you have uh, the serial one here it looks like this and uh, the program to put here input.r in this case i suggest you take the one that is one up here the serial.r and uh, just make sure they are in the same directory or do, uh, I guess you can also do, uh, let's see. Intro. Go to CD intro. And then open this one, serial. Then you can go down here, change this one to, I believe it was called serial. And since it's one up, you do like this. And then you would be able to submit it like that. And as you can see, now you've got the job ID. And it's already run. So I will submit it again and then do like this. Then you can see it is status R for running. It has run for one second. It's running on this node and it just got the default name of uh, my uh, serial job or whatever, because I think I actually had named it in it. And here's the job ID and things like this. So. Uh, when you soon have a lab, you can go and try and do these things. So I will stop sharing.